Alături de mine este Margaret Franken, care este CEO al CFA Institute. Margaret, thank you, thank you very much uh, uh, that you are here. How is your life? It, uh, thank you very much. I am delighted to be here, and I know that you have quite a following, so it's yes, an honor from the be beginning. From the beginning, so it's an honor to be here um, with you to spend some time talking about what we're doing here. I think uh, we had uh, two journalists who start as a journalist, and right now they have a CFA certificate. Yeah, we have um, people everywhere um, in the system, so I'm delighted to hear that you have a couple of journalists. First of all, uh, if you want to mention something about CFA, CFA yeah. Institute, yeah. because so not many people in Romania are very familiar with yes. this institute, the importance in, uh, in worldwide. Great. Well, CFA Institute represents the investment management profession globally. We have about 200,000 members in every corner of the capital markets and pretty much every corner of the world. We're known for our flagship program, the CFA Charter Program. It's um, an a very rigorous program um, that we now have, I think, about uh, 300,000 candidates who will be writing the um, exams over the course of the year. And again, it's one of the toughest exams in this, uh, it is, this industry. It is. It's three levels, um, and we've made our most extensive um, set of enhancements to the program um, through the COVID period. We took that time to really evaluate what employers need um, what candidates need. So we built out our uh, learning portfolio for investment professionals throughout their career. And then finally, we have a quite significant research arm, our research and policy center, which really tackles some of the most intractable challenges facing the industry and ultimately um, society. So our mission is to lead the investment profession with the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence for the ultimate benefit of society. And I suspect we'll touch on some of that today. Okay, uh, who are you, first of all, and how you became this uh, CEO of mm. this institute? You have uh, this certificate, yes? I do, I do. So I have um, about 35 years of experience. Uh, 35 I've, years. Yeah, so I started this role. I took it over in September 2019. Um, but I started my career in 1992 with State Street Global Advisors. And when a long I time ago. A long time ago. And when I came into the industry, what was apparent to me was the most professional people and those who had the most advanced careers had their CFA charter. So um, I wanted a good career. I took the program and I have had a really quite an interesting career for me. Um, I spent 30, almost 30 years on the asset management side of the business, started out working with pension plans, endowments, foundations, government agencies, have had institutional all the way through my career, and about 15, 20 years ago also started working with on the private wealth side. Okay, and uh, you are here in Bucharest for what? Annual uh, conference? Yeah, so we're here for the... Um, CFA Institute and CFA Society uh, in Central and Eastern Europe Investment Conference. Um, this is the 10th conference that they have, so it's quite a big anniversary for them this year. And over that period of time, the region has just grown dramatically and made great strides economically and in the investment landscape. Uh, what is the uh, subject and the theme of this uh, annual conference? It's a wide variety of um, topics. We've heard from central bankers, we've heard from minister, uh, ministers of um, economy and finance, uh, and then we have investment professionals, um, analysts and strategists who are really talking about uh, what the region looks like, um, what it looks like prospectively, and how we've got here, both the opportunities and challenges. You won't be surprised about some of the topics, digitalization and artificial intelligence. We have a um, great keynote at the end. Uh, we are talking about sustainability and, of course, what the macroeconomic environment is. So as central banks start to pull back on the policy that has been so persistent over really a long period of time. What does that mean for the markets, um, investors, and governments 
corporations and individuals as a consequence. Look, markets survived this in crisis of interest rates. Is the highest increase rate in 30 years. Okay. Um, do you think the interest rates will come down as they were in 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Well, no. And the reason is if you look at really almost everybody, even the most seasoned professionals who are working in the investment profession, their whole certainly mature careers have been defined by declining interest rates, declining inflation, and growing GDP as a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall, which unleashed... Globalization, yeah, the rise and of the China, yeah. and so on. All of that came really, um, you know, out of out of tremendous inflation in the 70s, so you have to raise interest rates to combat it. And then globalization really came when the Berlin Wall fell because you could unleash amazing um, Eastern European talent, but you could also transport goods from China. So we've, in, and uh, Southeast Asia. And so you can see now we're at, and that's a perfect scenario for all assets to do well. So you can see we had zero interest rate policies. Like, I mean, that's extraordinarily abnormal, particularly in a globally coordinated way. So now you've seen rising inflation, rising interest rates, and deglobalization. Um, and that creates much greater headwinds for um, creating, uh, creating the types of returns that we've experienced. From your point of view, for your experience since 1992, yeah. okay, uh, how how the future will be? Yeah, because well, it will be the end. Let's say in ten years it will be the end of the cheap money. Yeah, is deglobalization. Yeah. You know, it's war. It's military war. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how the the market will be? So one thing about markets is we had we have episodes of spikes in real stress in the system, and they're consequential. No question of it. But it is remarkable how innovative the markets are. So when I started my career, that was really the beginning of the impact of technology on financial products, democratization of investing. So in 1992, that was the first year of the launch of an ETF, the Spider. Yeah. We were able to take theoretical concepts, you know, um, modern portfolio theory and be able to put it into practice and you saw the rise of quantitative um, investing because we had the technology we had the computing power and we had models to do that I think it's different than we might have anticipated 30 35 years yeah, ago it's another word it's always innovative and I think that has been a persistent theme irrespective of the challenges that markets face it drives new innovation. And I think you'll see the same thing out of this period. Three major shifts, though, that are going on and have serious consequences. First of all is the end of cheap money. The second is, of course, greening the economy, developing a sustainable economy. We can spend a little bit of time talking about that. And the third, what looks like could be the next um, revolution in industrialization. The industrial thing is, of course, um, AI and its implications for everybody, but certainly for the investment industry. But what means end of the cheap money? Yeah. Okay, uh, no, uh, no zero interest rates yeah. for the um, for the return on investment. Yeah. Well, you can expect returns will be less. And if you think will about it, less, it will return. be less than they have been before. But if you think about it, um, you know, you now can get a higher risk-free rate. So we usually build portfolios on what's your risk-free rate, what the government will give you, what's your premium for um, taking on risk, and then what's, of course, the inflation rate. Higher inflation rate in sort of the medium term is going to eat into eat into well, last yeah. Yeah. I think if we were having this conversation two years ago everybody said it was transitory inflation uh, wage inflation is critically important to pay attention to and wages are going up everywhere so inflation Will is be likely persistent to be, inflation yeah and you look at so you 
you mentioned um, war. There's you know sort of war going on in the major theaters. These disrupt supply chains. They have consequences for the cost of goods, the movement of goods, the how much you pay to to um, deliver them, to create them and deliver them. So that will make it through prices and obviously through to inflation. So I think we can expect inflation so to persist. So the end of the day will be a lower return. I think so. A lower nominal return, yeah. Nominal. Yeah. Okay. The second, uh, this uh, sustainability trend, you mm -hmm. know, all this come from uh, uh, European Union and the United States is not, uh, it's in the middle, okay. Uh, uh, this trend, how will affect the financial markets? Yeah. So I think, again, it's, it's thematically on point to what I said earlier. It will cost us to um, make the climate less warm. You know, we know that at 1.5 degrees or at 2 degrees, we see the consequences of that. And no part of the world... Yeah, maybe in, in England. You stay in England, yes? Yes, England yeah, and New York. The and yeah. <laughs> okay, the weather will be better with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually Canadian, and the weather might be better <laughs> in Canada. Um, but you can see no part of the world was exempt from the consequences of climate. So even those climates you say might be better, England's now apparently going to be a good champagne um, grower. You can see uh, whether volatility affects infrastructure, whether that's flooding, whether that's tornadoes, whether that's uh, heat waves or extreme cold. All of those things have a consequence on infrastructure, which needs to be rebuilt. It has consequences um, for physical for physical plant, uh, certainly insurance costs, all those kinds of things that matter to people. So it's going to be expensive. It can't be financed alone by capital markets. And so it will require greater integration between uh, government policy and um, capital markets. But uh, do you think will be enough money to f for all these projects? The money will be very expensive. Yeah. And the return will be well, the return zero. No, I think the return actually could be quite significant. So um, earlier this week I was um, in France and we were talking to uh, a number of managers who are doing um, who are really focused on sustainable investing. And what they are seeing is technology uh, that will produce at scale results, whether that be in um, agriculture, yield, um, water treatment, the kinds of things that really um, matter. So I think in the early days of anything, it's much smaller scale. Um, and now we can see uh, renewable energy sources at scale. We're starting to see agriculture opportunities at scale. That creates great opportunities, not just for the niche managers, but really for investment returns broadly. What means AI for the um, for this industry? Yeah. So I think when to um, administrate money. Yeah. So first of all, the industry has had a long history of using algorithms, you know, using technology to help improve what we can look at from an investment perspective. And then of course, ChatGPT came out. So generative AI, large language models, um, big data, at its core for investment outcomes, we think can be quite positive. Think about um, the amount of data that is coming our way that allows us to either validate or further explore investment thesis. You have more data, you have better ways to process it, you should be able to deliver richer insights. Left is less uncertainty. Yeah, but look, we have, you have data for the past. You don't yeah. have data for the future. And as is, mm. is a recommendation for investment, the past will not apply for the future. Yeah. I think actually the way to look at data is a little bit differently, not just historical data. Of course, that's an important piece of information. But let's just take something like um, what you can get from uh, GPS and satellite information on transportation. So we know that we can take a look at vessels. We can tell by how fast they're moving, how high up they are on the water, what the loads look like. So you may not need to rely on dated government information 
on um, goods being transported. Now, that's a great piece of information to help you understand trade flows, whether you know they're they're. Um, whether there are opportunities or whether things look suppressed. Um, I think it's the data that you can get in the moment that also augments your investment decision making. And that's the kind of thing we teach in the CFA program, right? Like what, not all data will be historical. You are at a moment in time trying to assess multiple inputs to determine, and that's what an analyst does and a portfolio manages, is to project into the future. So the more data you have available to you, the better certainty you can get around that, or the more opportunities you can explore that you might not have been able to before. Yeah, for the future, uh, do you see any crisis on the horizon? I think it's going to be a series of rolling crises. Um, you know, it's interesting that the markets have responded reasonably well to what is significant geopolitical crisis right now. But I think... Do you have an explanation why? Because uh, the, mm -hmm. the money was available? Uh, I think, you know, part of it is the uncertainty around it. So we'll see blips every once in a while, and that's extrapolating what does it mean for supply chain, what does it mean for costs of commodities. I think at the end of the day, though, right now, the most important driver for returns is where interest rates are going to go. Um, you know, everybody's hanging on what the Fed is going to do. And the number one thing, no matter where I go in the world, um, both the public stage and in private conversations, the greatest uncertainty is where the U.S. election will go. Uh, we have a crisis uh, from the inflation, from the interest rates, from the geopolitical. Uh, maybe it will be crisis when the re when will be in November the United States mm. uh, yeah. uh, uh, result. Um, what do you think for the next year? I think for the next year, um, interest rates are high and that affords people the opportunity to park money in safe securities at a somewhat reasonable rate of return. So you can start to see that risk is risk appetite is not high liquidity people are keeping uh, money safe keeping their powder dry as it were um, we don't see the kind of leverage that we've seen before so you can see that a uh, good place to pay attention to that is um, private. so in the back the market are very healthy they're healthy and and pr private markets is a really good example of where you're seeing um, less leverage I think what it means for people though is to really evaluate what's their portfolio look like in that risk environment, what their real risk appetite is. And then finally, you know, time horizons, longer time horizons let you evaluate securities and portfolios differently. And if you look at the most sophisticated long-term investors, those big sovereign wealth funds and um, pension schemes, they really take advantage of that long time horizon to capture the liquidity premium, to, to take advantage of those opportunities. And I think that um, will be a feature. I think time horizons for measuring portfolio outcomes will lengthen. We're doing a fair bit of research on that and we'll be releasing papers on that, the benchmarks and uh, the incentive schemes. And I think it'll be quite interesting work that'll have a long tail effect, uh, probably for decades to come. Uh, what is the situation in Romania? Well, in Romania, we've just, of course, the conference is being hosted yeah. here. You and I had a chat just earlier. I think the last 20 years have been remarkable for Rom Romania. I know that you have a conference going on just yeah. across um, the way data on the data center. And the new big thing in Romania, the new big in thing. real estate. <laughs> well, there you go. See, so there's the innovation, right? Romania has land, it has energy, it has skilled talent, and it has capacity in all of those um, domains. So I think we see the same thing here. The um, data centers, skilled um, uh, uh, data people, as well as coders, technology, is paying a much more important role in the investment management industry. I think the same thing applies here in um, Romania. So I think it's... As you mentioned, we have, but we don't have financial market. It's no, you know, it's low, no. low, low. No. Well, one of the topics that we discussed at um, 
uh, at the conference was building up that capital market capacity that requires good regulation. Um, we know that the regulators here are very keen on the kinds of policy um, pr information that we can provide them. Um, we know that when you have more educated uh, more qualified investment professionals that makes the system better so we have a you know increasing number of candidates here and I will say that this um, European promotion of uh, qualifications is critically important y y you know it's been you got your charter and you could kind of keep going on it you now need skills in ESG you need skills in data science and artificial intelligence you need skills in private markets um, and, and increasingly in wealth management. So when you're thinking about, for instance, your pension scheme here, um, you'll need qualified individuals at the policy level, at the portfolio management level, and then at the level how you communicate it to the end beneficiaries. So we see a pretty good opportunity for more but charter holders. But how can we grow this uh, you know, capital market, yeah. stock exchange? Yeah. Because in the market in Romania, we have money. Yeah. So we have money, but we don't have enough, enough capital market. Yeah. And in the same time, uh, we don't have a strong banking system yeah. in penetration not in indicators, not in penetration. Yeah. The penetration, it's, it's more, yeah. it's under the half of the GDP. Yeah. So I think um, most systems around the world are successful when they have a strong banking system, policy okay. makers. The will banking favor. system is very strong in Romania, but it's, it's too low. Yeah, so I mean, I, I will readily admit, as a Canadian <laughs> running a global organization, <laughs> I don't think I'm the right person to be, um, to be commenting okay. on that. Yeah. So, do you think next year will be a good year for the investment? I have no idea. I think there are too many variables at play. They're very uncertain. And I think the opportunity for something new to pop up is just um, too high to make any sensible um, sensible prediction for what it's going to look like this time next year, which I think is really evidenced in the amount of cash on the sidelines, evidenced by risk, risk appetite low, liquidity high. Um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty. And the ability to predict has been really very poor in these last couple of years. You know, we thought there'd be a hard landing as central banks unwound their creative um, monetary policy solutions as they started to pull liquidity out of the market. And in, in many markets, that hasn't been the case. So, um, you know, m markets have done well and largely well, and I think it's hard, really hard to predict a year from now. For a young Romanian boy and lady, um, it is worth to have on uh, CFA? If you, Charter. yeah, and if you, why? If you want to be in the, I think the reason I got my charter, uh, you know, almost 30 years ago, is no different than it is today. If you want to be in specifically the investment markets, or if you want to be broadly in the capital markets, the CFA program is globally recognized. As you rightly pointed out, it's one of the hardest um, qualifications to get. And I think that speaks to the ri rigor, the applicability, and, um, and its very global nature. We're one of the only programs that is entirely democratic on the way in. It's affordable by time and by cost and globally but you recognized. you have to learn a lot. You do, and you should have yeah. to. You should <laughs> have to because, you know, when somebody saves money to trust somebody else to manage it to earn a financial return, they should be very qualified. That shouldn't be something to be easy to do. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great business, so you should be qualified to do it. Um, and what I will say is CFA charter holders around the world are incredibly proud of, of being part of that for that very reason. And they do stand, I believe, as a cut above um, because they have been able to master a wide body of knowledge applicable for the investment and finance industry. So thank you very much for, uh, for here at ZFF Life to have a good day. Thank and you for uh, having me. 
we'll see, let's say, next year. <laughs> what do you predict for next year? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's the right answer. Ok, uh, thank you very much. A fost uh, Margaret Franklin, uh, președinte și CEO la CFA Institut. Cam atât a fost ZF Live de astăzi. Ne revedem mâine de la ora 12. O zi bună continuare.